Welcome to The Ancient Light of the Yeshua Teachings, eight-episode mini-podcast with actress, musician, and author, Verenia Nia Peoples, and ancient Aramaic wisdom keeper, Dale Allen Hoffman. Episode 5, Blessed Are the Meek. Welcome, welcome, everyone. I'm excited to have Dale back here. Dale, your lighting looks amazing. It's even. You're glowing equally on all sides. It's all artificial. All the way around. <laughs> 100% artificial facade. This is uh, this is one of my favorite courses that we'd offer that we've ever offered up on um, on human harmonics. So I'm super grateful to have you here and to have everybody else joining us again. Uh, you have a special treat for us this morning. This afternoon, I should say. This morning, it's sure. The beginning. I mean, at the beginning, we're at the beginning of this. Maybe morning for somebody. Um, No, it's absolutely morning for somebody. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Well, I've got something at the end that I'll reveal at the end of the call. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. So, did you want to tone us in today? Yeah. Okay. I brought my um, one of my Tibetan bowls. Uh, funny that I used to have this, if you look at some of my older YouTube videos, I had this green crystal bowl that I had gotten from China, I don't know, 12 years ago, bought from China. Um, and just one particular day I was in Franklin, North Carolina, a place called the Spiritual Light Center. And I opened it up and I had one of my tingshas, you know, the little cymbal bells and went whack and hit it. And it like broke into like six pieces. And I was just like, uh, and this thing was like my right arm in a lot of events. But the weird thing about it was when it broke from that point on, I should take it out of storage. I still have it in storage. Everybody told me I should bury it in the garden or whatever, but it actually sounded like a church bell after that. So I thought that maybe that was a sign that I wasn't supposed to turn my back on what I'm doing. I don't know. But anyway, what I'll do is I'll play this, keep putting it in front of my light. Uh, Oh, I look like I'm dead. Um, I'm just going to tone the bowl for about a minute, and then I'm I'm going to move into uh, a little bit of a tone and recitation of the Aramaic Lord's Prayer, which I think I did. I don't know if it's been on these calls. It was probably when I did the Bridging Worlds call with Nia about a month ago. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, only thing you need to do is nothing. Just be open. Uh, allow the vibrations as much as you can through your little speakers to move through you. I'm going to try to keep the bowl low just so I don't look too much like rigor mortis blocking all my light. Let's take a deep breath in the nose. Hold that just a few moments and then I want to be able to hear your exhale, okay? Full release. Let's do that two more times. Breathe in the nose. Hold that in the temple just a few moments and then one more. So I'm going to spend about one minute with the bowl, maybe not quite that long, actually, and then go into the Aramaic prayer of Yeshua, the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father. I'll do it in Aramaic and English. sure to keep your breath moving, keep your breath open.
הבונד ושמיע נתקדש מוק תתי מלכותוק נחווי צביה נקי קאנה ושמיע אפ בעוריה. הבלן לקמא דסון כנן יומנה. ושפו קלן חלבין כתהן. אי כנא דב חנן שווקן לחייבין. ואילה תחלן לנס יוני. אלה פצן מן בישה. מתו דדלקי מלכותך, וחייל ותשבו כתר, לעולם אלמין. Big breath in the nose. Hold that just a few moments and then full exhale. Our one absolute eternal being of which we are born forth from the realm of the all and the only I am empty within your presence and And the purity of the vibration of your name. Empower my creative expansion through your emergence from the unseen realms, as I realize our life and will as one on the manifest earth as in the unseen heavenly realms. Provide the nourishment of clear insight and realization through me now and in each present moment. Release the echoes of my hidden past as I cancel all of my concerns with others. Do not let me lose my true self in forgetfulness, but wholly release me from the errors of my perceptions. For the undivided holiness is the absolute, the all, and the only and our deep intimate realization of the gratitude and grace of shining universal magnificence from cosmic gathering to cosmic gathering from age to age from aeon to aeon L'Elam Almin, forever and ever, from moment to moment, from now to now. May the radiance of these pure intentions be the rooted, fertile earth center from which all my actions flow. Oh, let's all tone the sound. Amen, amen, one time and then return to silence, okay? Get a beautiful breath in. Amen.
Ja. So those are the, the two most profound, powerful, effective, efficient methods, modalities that I know of to come wholly, fully into the present moment. Toning and breath, being aware of my breath, the rise and fall of my breath, and of course, the toning, which are sort of essentially, they're kind of the same thing. In Aramaic, it's the same word in both cases. Rucha, rucha, rucha again, which we talked about, was it last week? No, it was two weeks ago. Rucha means frequency. Rucha means expansion and retraction, not contraction, but retraction. Gravity would be an example. The rise and fall of the breath, what we know of is spirit. Air, movement of air across your skin, wind, magnetism, nuclear forces would hit it. The force of electricity, those are all words in Aramaic or all English words that go back to that Aramaic word, rucha, rucha. Again, it's a, a, I said a couple of weeks ago, it's a bit of a, it's not a travesty per se, but it's a bit unfortunate that the focus is so much on some kind of disembodied spirit in the Jesus teachings rather than what the ancients would have understood it as which is the rise and fall of the breath, which is so immediate. What a difference there. So um, you got something to say, Nia? I was going to turn it over if you had something you wanted to, like, pipe in or something. or Just um, as, I was, as I was experiencing uh, the Lord's Prayer, in Aramaic and then in English. And I've experienced it with you a handful of times. It, it always brings you right into the present now. So it's as if, I, even though I've heard it before, it is alive right now. And everything is right in this now. And, and what I've been moving through personally has to do with um, expressing from this state of whole truth and so it is about bringing me back and bringing us back to that which is which which we truly are and we have come here to express into form otherwise there would be no reason for form <laughs> right and absolutely so coming into that present place is so beautiful and it's such a, a beautiful experience for me I don't know if anyone else wants to pipe in on their experience of, of the Aramaic and the English prayer. Anybody, anybody? Vicki? I think you can, there you go, you can unmute oh, yeah, you yourself. Yeah, you have to unmute yourselves, I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> I, I have also um, experienced Dale in person doing this and I'm almost, astounded by the quality of the extension that I can feel through the release of his breath where I'm at. And it's just like, there's no separation. We're, we're in the same time and space and it's so powerful. And mm -hmm. um, the, the nuances of since the last time I was in person with him, um, doing this and then feeling it um, since I've expanded my own spiritual journey to feel the nuances within my body of that um, is, is incredible. And um, it's, it, it's, it's like, it's never the same. There's mm -hmm. always a new space within. Yeah. I would love and this. I would love to share with people how actually you and I met, which is pretty Unique, and actually it revolves around the prayer, funny enough. Um, Loretta and I had, well, I had done an event in the, in the way out in the desert at Eden Hot Springs outside of Phoenix. This is like maybe eight or nine years ago. 
And we were co-facilitating that retreat with uh, our friend Parangi, who's this amazing Brazilian-based uh, healer, amazing sound artist. And our friends that have a band called Rising Appalachia from here in Asheville and Atlanta, we were co co sort of headlining this retreat. But after that, Loretta and I just got in the car at, at the last day of the retreat on a Sunday early in the morning. And we're like, we're going to drive to Sedona because I wanted to meet Michael Mirdad, who we had like a lot of mutual friends, et cetera. And I end up, we end up at this un at Unity in Sedona the Unity Church, and we go in, and Michael was amazing, just like we had heard, and I got to talk to him a little, and then it's like we wander around and stuff, and then I end up, like, with Loretta, I'm like, let's go into the bookstore, so we sort of wander into the bookstore, um, and I don't know how the conversation started, there's this woman behind the counter, and um, I said, well, we're in town, because I was, you know, we were doing a retreat, and she was like, yeah, she mentioned having a couple of friends that had gone or something like that. And she was like, can you, could you actually speak the Aramaic Lord's Prayer for me? And um, which, you know, sure. I'm like, of course, anytime anybody asks me that. And I'm standing there uh, and I took her hands and I, and I just, whoosh, I get like right into that space. And it was like, whoosh, 2000 years ago, the two of us were projected backward. And it was this incredible, like the, you could, you could hear a pin drop on the other side of Sedona. I think um, the whole room went quiet. The, the sanctuary went quiet. People were coming in from outside and it was just this amazing recognition of sort of re-meeting somebody that I'd probably spent lifetimes with. And it was through the Aramaic Lord's prayer, which is the coolest thing about it. Um, and then at some point we just, I don't know how we reconnected after that, maybe months later, et cetera. And then she came to like one of our, she came all the way out to Asheville for one retreat. And then I believe another retreat. Right. And, um, and there's always, we've always had this pretty, uh, really strong connection, but wild enough, it actually started with the prayer, kind of a neat way to open that up. Um, I'll remember that forever. It was, the, you know, the energy. And, and when it comes through me, it comes through different every time. It's uh, sometimes it sounds Lakota. Sometimes it sounds Near Eastern. And sometimes when the English comes through me, the words are a little different because I'm not grabbing from my memory as much as I'm, I'm in this open portal and the energy's coming through and I'm essentially directing it. So obviously my memory's there, but it's it's almost like the energy that my 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 memory is getting its energy from the flow that's coming through the portal. And I'm just kind of directing it. And and not even directing it. It's almost like it's just a subtle allowance or guidance. And and I don't even feel like it's me guiding. It's more like me allowing is the best way. Uh, and the more open I am, the more immediate it feels. And then I have these those experiences where it's 2,000 years ago and it's now, which is why I love at the end of the prayer. It's not just forever and ever. It's moment to moment. It's from now to now. <laughs> yeah. And I think beautiful. it's so it's so beautiful, Dale, because what it says to me is that it's not a like a, a linear mental learning like to learn the words and the pronunciation. It's an experience of sound. It is very and, much. And so as we, it's the, it's, and it is the difference between doing it and being it. And in that space, you are in that portal and you are co-creating with, with everything that's flowing through it. And in that space, we know our truth. We experience ourselves truthfully. And there, because we're always expanding and contracting and moving and shifting, we, sh we shift with it. And it's a really, um, it's a, this is the freedom that we seek where we need that, we need to have the freedom to move and, and to shape shift in that, in that way to follow lines of pattern, the, you know, the lines of truth and patterning. So it's really beautiful. It's exactly, it's exact. Yeah. And, and, and that, it, you know, that leads me right into, you know, our, our subject today, which is so, it's such a gentle subject and yet 
it's so heavily misunderstood. And I, I would even, you know, it, it might not sound, I'm not saying it is sexist per se, but the, this particular beatitude has been twisted, including by the church and by males in the church to become a misogynistic almost um, weapon. Uh, and that's that, that third beatitude of blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. It's, it's odd, especially in, it, it's there a little bit in the Koine Greek. It's really there starting from the Latin, from Jerome, where all of a sudden the Beatitudes are like these theological promises of like, I kind of mentioned this a few times in the calls where it's like on the front end of the Beatitudes, it's saying, blessed are you who, you know, excuse me, gets the piss beat out of you in life because after you drop dead, you're going to go to this place and, and you'll be rewarded. Unfortunately, what the Beatitudes originally were, well, not unfortunately, fortunately, what they were in Aramaic were the front end was essentially do this and activate, or should I say, activate this within yourself and experience this in your life. And, and they, they, they step on each other. They, they, it starts with the first. In order to get the second, you have to understand the first. In order to get the third, you have to have the base of the second and the first. Um, but the third one is, has, is interesting because it has a feeling of like meek. You know, if I say meek, to me, it, it, I've heard, I hear like timid, like a mouse. I feel like a, like a, rich, like a contraction or retraction, like almost like pulling back which is an oddity of translation because the word in Aramaic actually uh, is it. Can you, I'm going to share this something from the screen. Do you, uh, is that okay? Nia? I'm actually going to um, hang on. Yeah. Let me do okay. my thing here. I should do this right off the bat. Make you should. I know <laughs> I'm a terrible hostess. I'm okay. really good in person though. I make really good food. I can definitely never cook for me ever. You never asked me to. Well, valid, valid. We've been to dinner, <laughs> lunch many times, That's breakfast, true. but you never cook for me. <laughs> anyway, okay. So, um, oh, look at that. Neato. Oh, um, so woo, I'm going to go to this, this one here. So when I actually change to a different, or was it on the, there, yeah. Hold on a sec here that okay that one so if everybody can see this this is actually a chunk of what's called the Kaboris codex it's a i think i brought it up in one of the other calls this is a two two thousand year old text and um it's uh that we're actually looking at the beatitudes here so if everybody can see where if you can you see my cursor going in a circle? Yes. Yep. So we've got Tubve Hun and then Lamakike. This right here is the word. And you can see all the dots above and below. Those are called diacritical marks, phonetic markings, etc. So this is the word that was translated as um this is the word translated as let's just say meek. We'll just call it that Dehanun Niartun Areya. Okay, I'm going to just stop that. Now, makike is an interesting word because it would be closer, of course, to... First, well, let me put it this way. This meekness, and meekness can be looked at in different ways. Timidity and meekness, does it feel empowering to you? And there's not a right or a wrong to this. Different people are going to have different feelings about this. Not Some people me. are okay with timidity or meekness. But it's it. I, this is one of those ones that I've had literally battered women come to me and say, uh -uh, I don't do that. You know, can you explain this? Blessed are the meek. What does that mean? Blessed are the doormats. Blessed are those who get, you know, whipped down to the ground. The ones that have been in abusive relation after abusive relationship. And, um, odd, you know, to me, meekness is like a shrinking back, the timidity. But that word makike, actually, it's closer to this word, humility. Humility. Humility to me is not a retraction. It's actually, to me, it feels like an expansion. 
And I'm going to give you a quote from the Lakota. They say, let the wind blow through you. Now that's not like, you know, and I had many conversations with Wayne about this, my late teens, early twenties, Wayne Dyer. And Wayne would always say, you know, oh, I just happen to have, you know, he was like be a candle flame that never flickers though the worst goes before you. And I remember in my twenties, I asked them once, I don't know, we were in Florida, New York, Philadelphia, who, who knows. And I said, you know, can you give me a little bit more of that? And he's like, what does it mean to you? And I was like, well, to me, I think what it felt like was, you know, to be so sure of who I am that I don't flicker, you know, I don't waver or wobble. And he was like, well, I look at it a little bit differently. He was like, I look at it almost like being so wholly open that nothing can grab, nothing can hook on, that everything can just naturally move through you. And I remember having tears in my eyes. Yeah. And of course, if you look at the, you know, you take the Aramaic backward to the old English and then go back to the Latin, the Latin root of the word humility is humus. That's the Middle Eastern chickpea dip. You know, you put pita bread and no, never man, that's hummus. Humus is that black, that's an awful joke that I'm still doing 20 years later. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's that, that layer of the dark, rich earth that is not heavy it's not like this orange carolina clay we've got here in Asheville in the mountains it's porous and it's open and air and water can move through it and that's the root of the word humility funny about that and in the aramaic it essentially means to have an open naked unbound unhindered relationship with let me ask you this uh Let's say that you feel humiliated in a situation. Where does your body want to go? What what does your body physically, where does it want to go when you feel humiliated? Away. <laughs> and where else? It wants to go, where does it ground? It grounds into the earth. Yeah. Have you ever thought about that? It grounds into the humus. It grounds back into the mother. You want to stick your head in the sand and basically die with humiliation. Now, And, and it's amazing because in the, in the Tao Te Ching, it actually says, Blessed is the leader who, uh, or blessed is the one who can take on or process the humiliation of the people, for it is only this one who is fit to rule them. Meaning to be able to take on all of that energy and allow that to move through them without, allow, without hooking, hooking it in and getting drugged down in the current, that's the one that's fit to rule the people. And without talking about politics, you know, rather than someone who throws an insult and you have to throw it back because you never grew up, whatever. So it's a far different thing. But if you think about that humiliation, we're, we're grounding back into the earth. And I remember standing, this is 15 years ago. I've known David Wolf, you know, the raw food dude for 25 years now. I used to buy, I used to run a kitchen in Tampa at a health food store and we would buy his books out of the trunk of his car all the time. He would just drive around the country all the time. Um, the nature's first law books. And he and I were standing on the banks of the French Broad River here in Hot Springs, North Carolina, like 15 years ago. And, and we're both barefoot standing there looking at this raging river. The French Broad is one of the oldest rivers in the world. And he was like, you know, the, the human body seeks an electrical ground through the soles of its feet. And it does this every 90 seconds. And if it doesn't find that ground, it immediately goes into a state of stress which compounds every 90 seconds. And it's funny because I like, I haven't worn shoes since I was a kid. I've never spoken with shoes on. Uh, literally, if I do a radio show, my shoes are off. But my, my point in this though, is to remember that you've got the mother, you have the womb of the mother. She's there that we can actually ground into. And it's funny because my other passion language, although I'm not well-versed in it, I'm really, I'm really into Lakota and the different teachers that I've worked with. And it's amazing because, you know, with my, when the new, the newest Lakota dictionary came out like 10 years ago, I went through it looking up Aramaic words and I looked up and I found makikea, which is this word. And it meant to lay naked on the bare earth or the bare ground without a mat. In other words, to have an open relationship with Mother Earth. Wow. And amazingly, on the other half of this beatitude, it says, we'll inherit the earth. That word miratun, actually, it, it doesn't, the words that's translated 
as inherit doesn't mean inherit. Just like in John three sixteen, it it doesn't actually say you and you, uh, you know, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should not believe in Him shall not perish, but shall inherit everlasting life. It doesn't say inherit. It's, I know I flipped all through that. You know, it <laughs> said because it's just like to me in a way it's a waste of time, um, unless I speak it speak to it, what it actually is. But it doesn't say inherit there either. And all these different places, you know, inherit this, inherit that. It doesn't say inherit the earth here. The word actually means turn, be. If you remember Tuvo last week, which is repent, it means a 180 degree turn. Okay. This means turn, be, turn, be, was, is, already is, realize, come into conscious recognition of. In other words, you don't inherit the earth. You realize that you are the earth. And I'll give you a quote and I'll, allow you some time to let it sink in. And I think I mentioned it maybe a week or two ago from Father Thomas Berry. And Father Thomas, I was supposed to have lunch with him a few weeks before he died, but unfortunately it just didn't line up. But uh, Father Thomas said, the earth was once molten lava and now she is singing opera. Wow, the earth was once molten lava and now she is singing opera. We literally are the earth. Now, I want to read a little. I've mentioned this quote before because um, I don't know if it was the last call or the one before. When I was in my late teens, early 20s, I used to do a, a Course in Miracle study group with Marianne Williamson. This is like the early 1990s. Um, but this is a quote from her first book that I've mentioned several times in these calls. But this time I'm going to read it in full. And you've probably all heard it before. Funny, because on the internet, this was attributed to Nelson Mandela in his inauguration speech a lot of times because he said something similar, but not the same thing. Marianne said, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. You're playing small. Your meekness does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. You ever done that before? And I will say this too, especially women with men. The women make too much money. Nia's like, you know, the, the, the <laughs> too much money, too much success. Not all men, but it, that's, you know, for a lot of men, that's a hard one, you know. So your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. There's no shrinking back in that. That's the, and it's not easy. I mean, like right now, Britney Spears has been in the press again because of the whole, the conservatorship that her father doesn't want to let her out of. And um, I didn't watch the documentary. I mean, I guess I know a lot of the backstory of it. And the question started coming up, well, what about Whitney Houston? And what about all these different, always women who are had their things controlled by men? And it's this isn't really, a, this is not a male-female issue. But my point is, this line about meekness, this beatitude was actually used many times by the Catholic Church very much the Catholic Church, and maybe not quite as much the Baptist Church, to keep women down, to control them. And it's, to me, pe people ask me, why do I do what I do? That's one of the reasons of why I do what I do, because it's completely unacceptable. The Catholic Church still has their sort of, I think now they're going to start letting women say mass, you know, and that's, that's something, that's something. It, how long has it been that women could be an Episcopalian priest? I don't even think it's 20 years yet. So um, my point is this, that 
if you ever have that perception of a moment where you feel like you're going to shrink back because it might be a little too much for someone else, me, I'm like, I'm almost like on a volume of 124 hours a day, uh, which essentially, you know, I got to say that I read a quote last week from my friend, Dr. Albert Lachance, his book, The Modern Christian Mystic. I remember the first time that I w- went and traveled up to New Hampshire to, to stay with him for a few days to see if we could maybe do some work together. And we did this event at in Peterborough, New Hampshire, and it's online. It's also my... Uh, I have an audio program with Albert called um, A Unitive Vision, and the first hour is the Aramaic Lord's Prayer. The second hour is the Magnificat of Mother Mary. And um, we, but I'm actually sitting there at his table with his wife, Carol, that night, and Carol's this amazing English woman, and I'm just talking, and Albert's listening, and Carol's listening, and all of a sudden it gets quiet, and Carol's like, Dale, Loretta must be a saint my wife meaning and albert just starts laughing and i'm like (gasps) and she's like no no what i'm just saying is she was like she was like i'm a saint i have to be a saint because she was like albert is just like going nonstop all the time and the amazing thing about that though is is a huge a huge um part of that was that she was like but neither of you feel you know, like that in it, she was like, there's this humility. And I was like, honestly, to me, people acknowledge that in me a lot of times. And being from New Jersey, you don't acknowledge anybody for being humble. You just call them weak, usually. Um, But to me, it means a lot because it's none of this is really about me. It, It not at all. I'm just here. And I'm essentially being used for this amazing thing that's happening through me right now and i'd like to actually open it up to you know whoever we've got here to maybe you've got something you'd like to share um any kind of experience i see in the you know vicky wrote in the chat big difference between submit and surrender yeah and 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 that's an an interesting thing too i'll say that um this isn't about this wouldn't be about submit or surrender to another person in any way whatsoever. This is about a complete inner process. Absolutely. And um, if anybody's got anything you'd like to throw in here, because I want to open the call up more than we have been uh, to sort of get more of a dialogue going. If anybody's got any thoughts you might want to throw in there, maybe a personal experience. This is a really powerful question, I think. Um, to submit or surrender. And sometimes I hear that even with regard to service. Can you be in service, submit to serving others? Can you surrender to what your soul is calling you to do, which could be in service? Well, everything that you do that your soul, soul calls you to is always in service. But in the way that we have ourselves defined how society defines being of service. So it's a really interesting question because, I mean, I'd love to hear what other people have to say about it and their experiences. And then I want to ask the question, how do you know the difference between the two? And how do you feel? I would say also, how do you feeling. feel when you notice <laughs> the difference between that the is, two? And that is my a huge part of it. So. That was my point is that it is, a, yeah. it is not a thought process, is that it's really a feeling. So does anybody have any experiences they want to chat about? Victoria. Just unmute yourself. <laughs> yeah, um, this this sort of understanding that we're we're trying to point to, I think, has been at the very crux of um, my my own journey most of my life, because I was uh, a woman in domestic violence. I was a child of neglect or abuse in a way. But the the interesting thing on on the other side of that is this this, um, powerful understanding of myself in the choices that I make in my life. And when I make them from a place of awareness and consciousness, I know whether I'm submitting 
or surrendering. And even with, um, um, you know, a, a love partner, the, the beauty of being able to be in the, the, the holiest of embrace of intimacy and to be in that, that place where you are able to receive them and be completely open and to trust what, what is unfolding. And to me, that's, it reminds me of a rose. You can't, you can't force one to open ever. The sun deems when a rose shall open. Because if you were to force a rose to open, all the petals would fall off. Mm. Right? And it's just being able to be in the, the pureness of that, that opening and, and to have the strength to be feminine in a world of distortion and to be open to receive the world in what it's offering in any single moment. And any time that I get stuck in my old shit or my patterns, I know I'm submitting my mm -hmm. ego's involved and it doesn't want to get out of the way for any, any reason because it doesn't feel like it has a choice. And then I remember, oh, that's, that's my pattern. Mm -hmm. And can I, can I open to a level in myself that allows that critical faculty to be crossed and I can tap into the joy of being an unconditional child of God? Mm. That's really powerful for me personally, even, you know, I, I, I didn't come from, from violence or, or domestic violence or things like that. But I, and I've always seen myself as being very um, kind of like, like, you can't really push me around, but to step the next step, like you said, and surrender to my femininity and trust, be willing to trust and it, it, you can't just trust anybody with everything. You know, this is following that feminine intuition. You know who you can trust to what degree and be willing to open. And that's, that's really powerful. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think my, my, my real lesson in this world was I came in naive and, and I was someone who came in, like we all do, in this pure essence of love yeah. so I could learn wisdom in it. And that was the gift. Very beautiful. Interesting. When I think back of like, if I think of myself, well, even yesterday, I feel, I look at myself yesterday. I'm like, God, how did I even, you know, walk? <laughs> it's like, I, I, I grow so quickly. But when I look like 20, 30 years ago at how naive I was and, um, and I see that, and when I see that in my children, you know, Nia knows my kids really well, you know, so does Vicky, and actually I would say Kathy probably too, but um, it, it's amazing. I remember like when my, when my children, before the children, before our first child was born, Dr. Michael Rice had told me, Dale, you're about to meet yourself in true living color, you know, Dolby and Dolby surround sound. I'm like, what do you mean? He was like, you'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great so way it's to like it. you know i just amazing how the mirrors in my life and when i see like as an example you know something with my daughter and her husband in relationship and it's like if i hear something it's so hard for me not to sort of interject something it's really difficult to kind of stand and be not meek as in shrinking back, but to be in the humility of just allowing myself to be open and stay rooted and to just know that things are gonna, if, you know, I had to interject, I would, but um, it usually doesn't end well when I uh, sort of, you know, start to kind of puff out and, you know, I made jokes that when my daughter, my oldest daughter started uh, dating that I was going to have to start collecting guns and, and weapons and things, but I never actually did it, but yeah um big anybody else have any other thoughts insights sammy samantha yeah um no i have a kind of i was i grew up with a single mother who was very who is very emotionally abusive still but um 
I was very sheltered as a kid. I'm very sheltered. I didn't have that many friends. Um, and I went to college. I went to a big college. Um, I went through something with a guy one night at a party where in a sense I submitted to him, but not, you know, not, le <laughs> not legally, technically. Um, but it took a few years. I kind of blocked it out for the rest of college. And then the whole Me Too movement came up. And I feel like I sur not surrendered to it, but I feel like I, I feel like I did. I, I owned up to it and it became part of who I am. And I was living through it more than letting it hold me back, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, I mean, it's still hard, don't get me wrong, but I'm, it's, it's not as intrusive and I'm not blocking out anymore, which I think is, a, is better than what it was. That's amazing. That is so powerful. Dr. Beckwith, Bernard Beckwith says, ultimately all forgiveness is self-forgiveness. Because underneath everything is this thing of, well, how did I do that? Why, how could I let that be? What? So when you allow and you have no judgment of yourself and you be, as, as Dale is talking about it, you know, open and you let it pass through you without that judgment. Wow. Now you're, you're opening up to what life has yeah. and, and what you can co-create with it. So that's, I mean, yeah, Dale. I used to not be able to talk about it. <laughs> now here I am talking about it. So yeah, yeah, it's definitely um, been life changing. I mean, I, it broke me at first. I, I, th I mean, I think it would break anybody when it first after the black, like after I blocked out when the Me Too movement first started. But then, like, I think it was a big change and a, a big surrender, I guess, to the fact that it happened. But it, I don't have to let it control me. It's amazing how such massive regions of the brain that are also responsible for memory are triggered by movement in the limbic system. So like people that like the, that have not, they're, they're just, they're not aware. Some aren't aware at all. They don't even know it even happened. It's that far down or they just know something happened, but it's amazing how that wipes out large regions of the human brain for short-term memory for all kinds of things it pull it pulls in takes so much kinetic energy to keep that stuff down that the brain overcompensates and you, you sometimes i i when i meet sometimes people i can almost tell that the some of the happiest people with the biggest smiles you can almost feel it like right here and it's and it's almost like it's trying to force its way up and that if there's anything that I remember is that first thing I told everybody to remember in the first call is the <sighs> breathe. And if I just put my awareness on the rise and fall of my breath, my brain, my brain doesn't have the time to go into some kind of judgment about the person in front of me. But man, it's amazing how much, how much brain resource it takes to keep that crap down you know, and stuff happened to me as a kid. And I was in my twenties before I went, wait a second, you know, this, that's not actually normal. Um, that's not healthy. What was done. And, but yet I had to find a way to live, not with it, but live through it. There's, it was the way you said that, Samantha, that was amazing. It was like, whoa, it was like perfect quote. Um, wow. It's big. That's yeah, really big. Yeah, I um, I think about, man, I think about a lot of people, like when I, I spent like basically 10 years on the road, two, three places a week for most of those 10 years. And it's amazing how many people you meet that come up after, like that I would meet coming up after an event that was like looking at my product table, whatever, and having questions. And it's amazing that sometimes every once in a while I'd see someone 99 out of a hundred times, it was a woman and they would be off around everybody else. And I'd be aware, I'd be aware of them and they would start to move closer and then somebody would cut them off and then they'd move over here and somebody would cut them off. And, and any time that I was aware of that, I would consciously actually point at them and wave them up because 
they don't even realize. I'm, and a lot of times it's like, I don't know what I need. And I would just give, I'm just, I'm like, here, this is everything I've got. This is yours. You know, it's amazing how, and then I'll hear from some of these people a year or two later and it's unbelievable. It's like, I'm talking to somebody completely different. And I'm like, what did you do? And I'm not, I, they're just like, all, all I did was I just listened to everything you had. And I just kept listening and listening and listening. And then that motivated me to listen to Wayne Dyer, which motivated me to listen to Michael Beckwith, which motivated me to listen to, you know, a- Abraham Hicks, I was, you know, <laughs> you know and, and all this other stuff. And they were like, all of a sudden, everything going into me was positive. Everything going into me was uplifting. Everything going into me was, instead of all that regurgitation that I was doing within my own mind, of constantly cutting myself down, not good enough, not even aware of people just cutting them off. You know, every, you can just watch, watch someone like that walk through a shopping mall and you can watch people just walk right in front of them. But to see somebody to actually, to get that personal power back, not from surging out in some kind of military fashion, but or offensive fashion, but actually from just being rooted right where they are and just opening up. And, and essentially it's wild. They're just kind of like, all right, excuse me, motherfucker, bring it on. (laughs) But, and it's like, you can shoot right. Like amazing that the greatest warrior in the, in the Lakota was Tashunka Witko, crazy horse. Technically his crazy horse stands in sight was his name, which was actually his father's name and his grandfather's name. But amazing. Like he had they said he was the most humble guy in the world he would walk through the village with his head down he would go hunting and take that food for the the elderly and the people who had like a sick warrior or whatever and the other thing that's amazing the way they believed it the lakota believed he never got hit he never got hit with a bullet never got hit with an arrow he got cut once in a face-to-face fight and which put a slash on his cheek but funny enough they believed that he never got hit because he had nothing to hook that he was just wide open. He'd get off of his horse, get down on one knee, take his knife out of his pocket while soldiers were 30 feet away firing right at him and just calmly scrape the ice off the horse's hoof. Look right in their eyes, calmly put the horse's foot down, get back on his horse, and then circle back into the battle again. Amazing. But it was because he was open. It wasn't the that American or even Westernized, it's probably not just the West, that puffing out thing that we do, that bloat, it's the exact opposite. You stand in that power and you're just open and you let the wind blow through you. And what an amazing difference that is. That's really powerful. I know a lot of times people will talk to me about that this kind of a thing and they'll say, I need to put up boundaries. And I'm like, no, it's, to me, it's not about putting up boundaries. It's about expanding in the fullness of who you are. You know, a table doesn't have, have to tell you, hey, I'm a table, don't run into me. It's just a table. Huh. <laughs> it's just there. It is. And as we stand up in that, we don't have to tell people that we are it. We don't have to warn them that we are it. Just be it. And as we experience it, it there's an energetic thing. That, there's just this energetic space that we assume. And people energetically respect it. And that's why, you know, the, the call is to like love yourself first, because as you love yourself, others can love you. You know, if I want to be respected, I must respect myself. That's a hard one. Yeah. Like, love yourself first. It is. It is. <laughs> it sounds so easy. Yeah. Because it's got all that other stuff, the things you've done, the things you thought about, the things you were told weren't right, all that stuff. There's, I, I said this last week, there's no more intensive you know, frequency pattern in existence for humanity to collapse an open energy body than shame. It just immediately collapses. And I've seen that. I've seen it with kids. I've seen it with, you know, I wanted to make an announcement at the end of the show here or at the end of the call here, but you know, I'll give an example was I remember going the the first time Loretta and I went to see um, Passion of the Christ down in Florida. When it first came out, there's all these church, you know, uh, buses there. And it was awesome. The energy was amazing. You go in every show is sold out all day, all night for months and months and months. And we're sitting behind this a guy and and a little boy. I don't know if I think I might have mentioned this to somebody in my mentoring the other day, but I don't think I've said it on a call before on one of these yet. But 
the, I remember that they had that cat and nine tail thing that got hooked in Jesus's back by one of the guards. Mm-hmm. It was like barbs on it. And they went to rip it back and all this flesh flies into the camera, you know, CGI. And the little boy, he's in front of me, he's eight years old. And he was going, <laughs> and his father leaned over and I'm just breathing like, good dad, help him here. And he was like, you remember, he did this for you. Oh. And I remember going, you know, the, it, it, that to me it was the third beatitude exemplified. I mean, that was it. And and I, to, and on uh, the book I was mentioning, you know, is what I was talking about, where Don's talking here, the journey of Crazy Horse and Lakota history. It's sitting right here on my shelf. As a matter of fact, there's a whole stuff of of Joe Marshall stuff on my shelf. It's a there's also a great audio program. Um, about him, about Crazy Horse from Joe Marshall. But so down to the end of the call, I wanted to say this to everybody. There's a website. Well, it says aramactoning.com. I don't know if I can put an active site in the chat room, but all you have to do is copy it and drop it in a browser. And let me see if I can share the screen. People have been asking me to do something for a long time. And what they've been asking me to do is to do online courses. And I've wanted to for a long time. So it just went live a few hours ago. Um, it's an introduction to Aramaic toning, chanting the ancient, ancient words of Yeshua. And uh, I've got, if you go to just AramaicToning.com, it'll forward you to the site on Udemy.com and it gives you 50% off of it. So I just wanted to throw that out there. And this is the first of many that's coming. Um, The next one, the next course I'm going to be doing is going to be more technical. It's going to be about Jesus's words on the cross. What, what were the sets of words that he said as he was dying? And then after that, I'm going to do his I am statements. Like I am the bread of life. I am the way and the truth and the life. And then I'm going to start working toward like a full blown 30 to 40 hour 4k or HD video program all about the Aramaic Lord's Prayer, where you'll learn every little aspect about the prayer. You learn how to pronounce it. You learn all the meanings of the words contained within. And then at the far end, you get a certification. You get a certificate from this too. Um, There's probably going to be two more toning programs, but I wanted to put it out there. Y'all know this before anybody else. That's amazing. Um, AramaicToning.com? Just go to AramaicToning.com. Yeah, it'll automatically send you to um, let me I see put if it I can in the put, chat. Yeah, I'm going to try to put the full link in. Okay. Um, I don't know if it'll work, but yeah, that worked. So then you can just click on that, and that's the coupon code is is in it, and it should open right up. Awesome. Um, yeah, Dale, that works. that's exciting. Yeah, I've been working on this for a while, and you know that, and I worked really hard on it. Um, filming it took you know it was a bit of filming it's about two and a half hours the course but that's not the hard part the hard part is all the titling and music and formats and codex and yeah um and this one was only two and a half hours so when i get into ones that are like five or ten or more hours it's going to be like um anyway that the coupon code is good till friday and then the price will go up a bit more Um, Are these weekly courses? How do they? No, what this is, is it's actually 13, lucky number 13 um, video courses that you're going to just go and you're going to watch. And basically you'll be doing stuff along with me. There's also an ebook download that goes with it. Some of it comes from my book, Echoes of an Ancient Dream. Some of it's custom just for the thing um, where you're actually toning. We go through, is it seven or eight? of the words that Jesus actually toned. And I give you all different aspects of what the words mean and (laughs) mean. And then also we go through the process of toning them. And I give examples of different ways to tone the same, that's the same word by focusing more on the vowels or more on the consonants, things like that. Um, I've been wanting to do this for a long time. And when I asked a lot of people, I was like, what's the one thing y'all want the most? And people said they want something with toning, Or they want to learn all about the Aramaic Lord's Prayer. And I'm like, well, Aramaic Lord's Prayer is going to take me like a month to film and probably a month to edit. So, okay, we'll do the Tony one first. (laughs) That's a simple answer. Dale, that's um, awesome. I'm so excited about that. 
No. Okay, you guys, you have the link in the uh, in the chat there, and it's aramaictoning.com. And if you're on my email list and email goes out tomorrow, we have a video that's already on YouTube that hasn't been published. As soon as I get off the call, we're going to publish that. And it'll be on like Instagram and Facebook. And in a few days, you're going to go, oh, God, get out of my face with this. It's going to be everywhere. So, <laughs> Dale, how do, how do people get on to your email list? Just DaleAllenHoffman.com. Um, just go to DaleAllenHoffman.com, which I guess I could pull that up. But, um, well, I don't know. Let me see. I'm trying to go through on my – I'm trying to see if my link was on the um, – no, but anyway, just com, and the email list thing is on every page. There's even actually a newsletter um, thing on my website. Matter of fact, I can even pull that up there. Sorry about that. There we go. So you can get it on my email list right there. Newsletter. Beautiful. Nothing in person yet. Waiting. <laughs> waiting, waiting, um, waiting. Yeah, we've got requests to do. We had a Byron Bay, Australia thing we were going to do that got canceled. We were supposed to go to Glastonbury and Cornwall and all that in England. That got canceled. So maybe we're going to be doing something in England, maybe all the way at the end of the year. But England's on like a total lockdown very much right now. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, here in the U.S., I have no idea. Um we would have a retreat in May like we do every year in Asheville, but not now. So um, Portugal, cool. Joe Dispenza is doing his stuff in, uh, yeah, in, in Cancun. Yeah, cool. And yeah, so. Well, I had a, a friend that has, uh, I think her roots are in Tulum, which of course is on the Yucatan. And I've talked with her about maybe us co-facilitating something down there, but I don't know if you've met her before, um, <laughs> but I don't know that that'll be this year. Who knows? This year is so bizarre. And um, anyway, could be. Sorry, well, thank, we ran over a little bit. No, thank you everyone. Thank you all for um, being open. This is always amazing. And for your input for everything expressed has been beautiful. Yeah. Thanks everyone for sharing. And, uh, and Dale, I know some people have been asking whether or not some of what you teach, they can actually get in a PDF, you know, so when you teach those things, they're trying to take notes and they don't know how to spell it properly. It's in all my work. I mean, my, the, the, like my, the full set of what I have, it's also on my website um, and just click on special offer. It's everything I've ever done other than the course that's on you to me. It's all of my audio. There's PDFs in there, stuff that's never been released elsewhere. My book is included, all that stuff. And we cut the cost of it in half. And I think it's like $77 or something on my website for everything. That's and it's incredible. like thousands of dollars worth of stuff. It's for like college, you know, two years of college that doesn't exist, literally, like hours and hours of stuff. And you just put it in and just start listening and watching. Right. Um, that's basically what people do and then just keep repeating Incredible. but it's all in there everything I talk about thank you thank you thank you for bringing all this beautiful wisdom and the experience to all these amazing people and thank you everyone for co-creating this with us and I guess we'll be back next week yes bye, bye. thank you guys <laughs> bye. <laughs> bye everyone thank you for listening to the Ancient Light of the Yeshua Teachings, eight-episode mini-podcast with actress, musician, and author, Verenia Nia Peoples, and ancient Aramaic wisdom keeper, Dale Allen Hoffman. Please visit niapeoples.com for Nia's upcoming event schedule, books, and support product offerings. And please visit daleallenhoffman.com for Dale's upcoming event schedule, books, audio and video programs, support product offerings, and to join the free Aramaic Healing Circle email newsletter. We are committed to your awakening.